George Stevenson and the Invention of the Locomotive With Watt's steam engine to pump out the water and to hoist the coal, miners were going deeper into the earth and were bringing out more coal than ever before. The new giant turned countless mills for grinding corn and wheat and was harnessed to the machines lately invented for spinning and weaving cotton and wool. The day of cheap fuel, cheap food, and cheap clothing seemed at hand. One thing was lacking, a cheap means of carrying over land, fuel, wheat, cotton, wool, and the like to the mill or factory, and of carrying the finished product to the market. There was great need of a locomotive which would do good work at a small cost. Men began to work on such a locomotive. They did not, of course, try to invent a new engine, but to modify Watt's engine, a stationary engine, so that it would be a serviceable moving engine. George Stevenson succeeded in doing this. His Parents and Home about eight miles west of Newcastle, England, is the mining village of Wylam. Near the east end of the town, there stands a two-storied house of four rooms. The lower west room was once the home of the Stevenson family. The floor of this single room, which served alike for kitchen, dining room, parlor, and sleeping room, was of clay. The walls were unplastered, and the rafters were bare. Here, on June 9, 1781, George Stevenson was born. The father was the fireman of the Newcomen engine at the Wylam mine. With a wage of not more than a dollar and a half a week, and with six children in the family, there was scarcely enough food and little to spare for clothing. So poor was the family that none of the children were sent to school. But George received from his father and mother traits of character which were even better than riches, and made amends for his lack of early education. It was a trait of his to have definite ambitions. He set his hopes on an advance of one step at a time. When the desired position was secured, he was not satisfied, but prepared himself for a further advance. Upward Step by Step as soon as George was old enough, he was put to work. His first job was herding cows, at four cents a day. Growing older and stronger, he was hired out to do light farm work. He drove horses, milked cows, and hoed in the garden. But he soon joined his brother James at the mine, as a picker to clean the coal of dirt and stones. His wages were now 12 cents a day, and they were increased to 16 cents when he became driver of the gin horse. Driving a gin horse was well enough, but George wanted to be an engineer. To be an assistant fireman was the first step. Great was his joy when, at about 14, he was made assistant to his father at the wage of 25 cents a day. By the time he was 15, George had become a fireman and was still ambitious to be an engineer. He spent the greater part of his spare time in studying his engine and in learning how each part worked. It was a great event in his life when some two years later his wages were raised to three dollars a week. I am now, he was heard to remark, a man made for life. Not long after this, a new mine was opened and George became the engineer. It was his duty to run the engine, keep it in order, and look after the pumps. If for any reason the engine stopped and he was unable to make it go, he was to call upon the chief engineer of the mine. But the youth knew every part of his engine so well that he never needed to call for help. Modeling engines in clay was his main pastime. He made models of those which he had seen and of others which were described to him. In this way, he first heard of the engines of Bolton and Watt. Wanting to know more about them, he was told that he would find them described in books. Alas, George could not read. He did not even know his letters. He thus found that to advance further, he must be able to get information from books. Although he was as large as a grown man and was doing a man's work, he decided that he must go to night school. He went to school three nights a week, taking lessons in reading, spelling, and writing. During one or two winters, he took lessons also in arithmetic. This was easy for him. The secret was his perseverance. He spent his spare time around the mine on his sums. The problem solved during the day, he carried to his teacher in the evening, 
and received new sums for the following day. About this time, he decided to learn braking. A brakeman operates the machinery which hoists the coal. The work is responsible and well paid. A good friend allowed George to try his hand at the work, and although only 20 years of age, he was soon breaking at another mine. Thus, through attention to work and study, and through perseverance, George Stevenson advanced step by step from herd boy to brakeman. He educated himself and became a skilled worker. Further Improvement To add to his wages, Stevenson took to mending and making shoes in the evening. Among the shoes sent to him was a pair belonging to the girl who became his wife, a young woman of sweet temper, kind disposition, and good common sense. Happy in his work and content in his home, Stevenson set about improving the spare hours of the evening more diligently than ever. He studied mechanics and came to know thoroughly the engines of both Newcomen and Watt. He took also to modeling machines. One of these was a perpetual motion machine. Though it proved a failure, as all others have, it gave him an opportunity to whet his powers of invention. Shortly after the death of his wife in 1806, Stevenson went to Scotland to superintend in a cotton factory a Bolton and Watt engine. This gave him the chance he had long wanted to work with one of those wonderful machines. He remained there a year, returning with more than $100 saved from his wages. In the meantime, his father had met with an accident. While he was inside of a Newcomen engine, a workman turned on the steam. The blast struck him full in the face, not only scalding him terribly, but putting out his eyes. The poor man struggled along against poverty as best he could. On the son's return, his first step was to pay his father's debts and a little later he moved his parents to Killingworth, where they lived for many years, supported entirely by him. An Engine Doctor For some unknown reason, the engine at the High Pit, a coal mine near Killingworth, failed to work, and the miners were driven out by the water. The engineers of the neighborhood were called in, but each in turn failed to discover the trouble. One day Stevenson wandered over to the mine and examined the engine carefully. Well, George, asked a miner, what do you make of her? Do you think you could do anything to improve her? I could alter her, he replied, and make her draw. In a week's time, I could send you back to the bottom. This conversation was reported to the manager, who in despair decided to give Stevenson a chance. George, said the manager, they tell me that you think you can put the engine at high pit to rights. Yes, sir, I think I could. If that's the case, I'll give you a fair trial. The engineers hereabouts are all beat. And if you succeed in doing what they cannot do, you may depend upon it, I will make you a man for life. The engine was taken to pieces, and many changes were made. These were completed in about three days, and the engine was put to pumping. By 10 o'clock that night, the water was lower in the pit than it had been for a long time, and by the end of the week, the workmen were sent back to the bottom. Stevenson had made good his words. His skill as an engineer doctor was noised abroad, he was called upon to prescribe remedies for all the wheezy, creaky, pumping engines of the neighborhood. As an engine doctor, his wages were good, and he soon left the regular workmen behind. They, in turn, were jealous of him and looked upon him as a quack. The manager of High Pit, however, believed in him and succeeded in 1812 in making him engine right at Killingworth. Educating his son Stevenson often thought of the difficulties he had in life because of his lack of schooling. He was determined to give his only son, Robert, born in 1803, a good education. As soon as Robert was old enough, he was sent to the parish school. The education to be had there scarcely went beyond the primer and writing, and it soon seemed best to send Robert to Newcastle. This was expensive, and Stevenson's earnings were small. Besides, he was the sole support of his afflicted parents. How was the money to be obtained? I betook myself, said Stevenson long afterwards, to mending my neighbor's clocks and watches at night, after my daily labor was done, and thus I procured the means of educating my son. Robert went to and from Newcastle on a donkey. But it was not only Robert who was at school at Newcastle, his father was also at school there. Their evenings were spent together in going over the lessons of the next day. Books were brought from the library to be read. 
when the desired books could not be taken out robert would bring home descriptions and sketches for his father's information the son thus helped to educate the father but such a father do you wonder that robert was later proud of saying that if his success had been great it was mainly to the example and training of his father that he owed it the first railroads and locomotives stevenson as engine wright at killingworth not only had to keep the pumping and hoisting engines in repair but it was also part of his duty to look after all the other machinery as he traveled from mine to mine he was on the lookout to find where improvements could be made among other improvements he began to look about a locomotive the locomotive was still looked upon as a curious and expensive toy stevenson saw more clearly than most others of what great use it might be not only in carrying coal to market but in transporting all kinds of products he turned all of his knowledge of machinery and all the power of his inventive mind to the making of a locomotive there are three parts to a railroad the locomotive the cars and the track on which these run the first railways were tramways used to haul coal from the mines to the wharves where it was loaded on boats to be carried to distant cities such tramways were often ten to a dozen miles long they were constructed by building a roadway more or less level and by placing upon wooden cross ties two wooden rails at some mines a thin plate of iron was nailed on the upper surface of the rails cast iron rails three or four feet long were also common the cars had a large hopper-like wooden body this huge body rested on a wooden platform made of heavy wooden beams these were fastened at each end to an iron axle which connected the two supporting cast iron wheels a horse could draw at the rate of two or three miles an hour two or more of these cars when loaded all together with from eight to ten tons of coal two parts of a railroad the rail or tramway and the cars were thus at hand when stevenson set himself to make a locomotive his object was to invent an engine which would take the place of horses on the tramways hence his locomotive to be successful must do the same work not only more satisfactorily but at less cost than it could be done by horses the idea of such a locomotive did not originate with stevenson nor was he the first to make one that honor belongs to richard trevithick who built a locomotive as early as 1804 this locomotive was able to haul 10 tons along with the cars men fuel and the like at the rate of five or six miles an hour for a short time it was in successful use but it broke so many of the small cast iron rails of which the road was made and ran off the track so often that it was soon put aside and the engine degraded to working a pump the trouble was with the track and not with the engine with a little more perseverance trevithick might have succeeded in making a successful locomotive and have risen to fame and fortune but trevithick was a genius fond of trying new projects he left his locomotive after a few trial trips to take care of itself and thought no more of it no one devoted much attention to the locomotive for some time still the idea was not lost in 1811 mr blenkinsop a mine manager near leeds decided to build one blenkinsop followed trevithick's design the big flywheel was however omitted while the new features were the two cylinders and a toothed wheel working in a track rail this toothed wheel and rack rail were contrived to overcome an imaginary difficulty even the wisest men of the time thought that if a load were placed behind an engine the grip or bite of its smooth wheels on the smooth rails would be so slight that the wheels of the engine would spin round and round in the same place and the engine never move naturally blenkinsop thought that the toothed wheel working in a rack rail was necessary if his engine was to draw a load blenkinsop's locomotive when loaded lightly traveled at a rate of 10 miles an hour it would draw 90 tons at three and a half miles an hour on a dead level or 15 tons up grade the locomotive cost two thousand dollars and did the work of 16 horses for more than 20 years it was in constant use and was the first successful locomotive ever made encouraged by blenkinsop's success mr blakett of wylam resolved to try a locomotive at his mine 
the first one made for him flew all to pieces on first trial he had a second one built which like the first was modeled after trevithick's and blenkinsop's engines the new locomotive had a flywheel and the driving wheel was cogged and traveled in a rack rail this engine was able to haul eight or nine loaded cars at the rate of a mile an hour it was too heavy for the track and the rails were always breaking the driver was asked one day how he got on get on said he we don't get on we only get off the chief cause of the failure was the cogged driving wheel working in the rack rail blakett learned by experiment that these were unnecessary his third locomotive built in 1813 was fitted with smooth wheels this new engine puffing billy was more of a success it was easy to manage and drew 10 to 14 loaded cars having a combined weight of 20 tons at the rate of four or five miles an hour stevenson's first locomotive stevenson's first engine blutcher was built in 1814 it was not much of a success the best that blutcher could do was to pull 30 tons on a grade at the rate of four miles an hour after a year's trial it was found that it cost just as much to haul coal by steam power as by horsepower there was little encouragement in this for the success of a locomotive depended on its economy stevenson set to work with new vigor and early in 1815 completed a second engine this new engine had a wrought iron boiler eight feet long and 34 inches through with a single flue 20 inches in diameter the flue was furnished with a steam blast the steam blast or forced draft was one of stevenson's wonderful inventions in the early locomotives the steam after doing its work in the cylinder was allowed to escape into the air with a horrible hissing which terrified both man and beast stevenson noticed that the steam escaped with much greater speed from the cylinder than the smoke came from the smokestack it occurred to him that if this escaping steam was turned into the smokestack it would produce a draft this by increasing the intensity of the fire would make it possible with the same size boiler to produce a greater amount of steam the experiment was no sooner tried than the speed and the power of the engine were more than doubled it is not too much to say that without the forced draft along with a boiler with a number of small tubes connecting the firebox and the smokestack invented afterwards locomotives might still be dragging along at a rate of not more than four or five miles an hour a successful locomotive in stevenson's first engine the power was applied to the driving wheels by means of cog wheels stevenson saw that if the locomotive was to be a success the power would have to be applied directly in the new engine the two cylinders were connected directly with the four driving wheels to obtain the necessary freedom of motion and to avoid the friction and jars due to rough places in the track ball and socket joints were used to join the connecting rods with the crossheads of the cylinders and with the crank pins of the driving wheels stevenson planned also to connect each pair of driving wheels by bars fastened to cranks in each axle workmen were however not able at this time to forge these cranks and it was necessary for the time being to fall back on connecting chains stevenson thus succeeded in making an engine having direct connection between the cylinders and the driving wheels direct connection between all the wheels and a forced draft these are the essential points in all the engines which have been built since stevenson therefore accomplished for the locomotive what watt had done for the steam engine building the first steam railroad although stevenson's locomotives were in daily use at killingworth and had been for years nobody paid any attention to them except a mine owner here and there there seemed little prospect that the locomotive would come into general use stevenson however had a growing faith in his invention in 1821 mr edward pease obtained from parliament authority to construct a tramway between stockton and darlington not many days later a stranger called on mr pease describing himself as only the engine right at killingworth george stevenson wished to be the engineer of the new road mr pease saw that he was the very man for the place when the stockton and darlington railroad was planned there was no thought of using locomotives on it none of the directors had any faith in them 
Stationary engines were to be put at the very steepest grades, but the bulk of the hauling was to be done by horses. Stevenson lost no chance to tell Mr. Pease of his locomotives. One locomotive, said he, is worth 50 horses. Come over to Killingworth and see what my engines can do. Seeing is believing. Mr. Pease finally went to Killingworth, and with him, seeing was believing. Three of Stevenson's locomotives were ordered to be ready for the opening of the road. As the time for opening the road came near, Stevenson became anxious. He was hopeful, however. At dinner with his son Robert one evening, he said, I venture to tell you that I think you will live to see the day when railways will take the place of all other methods of conveyance in this country, when mail coaches will go by railway, and railroads will come the great highways for the king and his subjects. The time is coming when it will be cheaper for a workman to travel upon a railway than to walk on foot. I know there are great difficulties to be faced, but what I have said will come to pass, as sure as you live. I only wish that I may live to see the day, though I can scarcely hope for that, as I know how slow progress is, and with what difficulty I have been able to get the locomotive thus far adopted, notwithstanding my ten years' successful experiment at Killingworth. The first of the three engines to be delivered was engine number one, locomotion. These engines were built after Stevenson's latest plans in his own factory at Newcastle. They did not differ much from the engines built eight or ten years before at Killingworth, but the workmanship was better. A great crowd gathered to see the new road opened. The locomotive was the center of attraction. Some came to rejoice, but many came to see the traveling engine blow up. A great procession was formed with engine number one at its head. Stevenson was the engineer. The train was made up of 12 cars loaded with coal and flour, a passenger coach for the directors and their friends, and 21 coal cars for other passengers, in all a train of 34 cars. At the head of the procession rode a man on a horse carrying a banner with these words on it, Private risk is the public's gain. At the signal, off started the great train. It moved at first at a rate of 6 to 8 miles an hour. Stevenson finally decided to try the speed of the engine. He signaled the horsemen to get out of the way and put on the steam. The train now rushed toward Darlington at the rate of 15 miles an hour, a marvelous speed for the day. The success of the engine excited great interest and admiration. The number of passengers to be carried was a surprise. Not much had been thought of carrying passengers, and when the road was opened, the company had only one passenger car, the experiment. Other cars were soon added. The bodies of some old stagecoaches were bought and fastened to the wheels of coal cars. These passenger cars were first drawn by horses, but it was not long before one of Stevenson's locomotives could be seen steaming merrily along, drawing a train made up of a number of loaded coal cars and one or two of these grotesque passenger coaches. Getting the Steam Railroad Accepted the success of the Stockton and Darlington encouraged a group of men who contemplated building a railroad between Liverpool and Manchester. Some of them went to Killingworth to see Stevenson's engines. After seeing them, one of them wrote, Here is an engine that will before long affect a complete change in society. Mr. Stevenson is the greatest practical genius of the age, and if he develops the full powers of that engine, his fame in the world will be equal to that of Watt. Naturally enough, when it was decided to build the new road, Stevenson was chosen engineer. The new railroad stirred up much opposition, particularly among the owners of turnpikes and canals. The newspapers printed all sorts of ridiculous things. The railroad would keep the cows from grazing and the hens from laying. The poisonous smoke from the locomotives would kill the birds, the grass, and the trees. The sparks would burn all the houses along the way. There would no longer be any use for horses. Indeed, it would not be long before there would be no horses, and therefore oats and hay would be worthless. The price of land would be lowered, for it would be impossible to plow the neighboring fields, and dangerous to drive along the nearby wagon roads. Besides, any number of people would be killed by the bursting boilers. All these fears seem ridiculous to us, but they were very real then. There was also great opposition in Parliament when the bill to construct the road was secured. 
people were not ready to believe that an engine could fly across the country with hundreds of persons in its train faster than the fleetest horse or dog could run the very idea was absurd all sorts of amusing questions were asked what would happen when the engine came to a curve in the track how could an engine go in the face of a strong wind suppose now said one member of parliament that a cow got in the way of the engine would not that be an awkward circumstance yes replied stevenson very awkward for the cow not only were stevenson and his idea of a steam railroad ridiculed but the best engineers of the day were called in to show that the road could not be built where stevenson was going to build it at one point the road passed over a great swamp chat moss no engineer in his senses said one of these experts would go through chat moss who but mr stevenson would have thought of entering chat moss it is ignorance every part of the scheme shows that this man has applied himself to a subject of which he has no knowledge thus george stevenson the engine right of killingworth with only his practical knowledge to guide him and his genius to inspire him battled for his ideas against the most learned men of the day he stood alone he was called ignorant out of his senses and mad but as he said later i put up with every rebuff and went on with my plans determined not to be put down when the liverpool and manchester road was nearly done the directors were puzzled as to whether it was better to use stationary engines or locomotives the engineers they consulted advised the use of a system of stationary engines placed at intervals along the way stevenson alone held out for the locomotive with public opinion against him for the most frightful stories were told about how dangerous and terrible the locomotive was he urged his view upon the directors in and out of season even in his darkest hour he declared locomotive railroads will before many years be the great highways of the world at length the directors decided to offer a prize of two thousand dollars for the best locomotive four were entered for the prize the novelty the sans pareil the rocket and the perseverance the rocket was stevenson's engine it did not look much like the engines built at killingworth or for the stockton and darlington but the principles followed in making the rocket were the same as in the earlier engines few parts and direct connection between the cylinders and the driving wheels there was one important improvement the earlier engines had a single large flue running through the boiler between the firebox and the smokestack the rocket was fitted with a boiler in which there were 25 copper tubes each three inches in diameter this style of boiler to be found now in all locomotives made it easier to keep up the steam the rocket was therefore the best and fastest engine that stevenson had built the trial was held at rain hill in eighteen twenty nine thousands of people including many engineers and interested persons the world over came to see the contest the novelty ran at the rate of twenty four miles an hour but it broke down the sans pareil traveled at an average speed of fourteen miles an hour but its pumps got out of order and it had to stop the perseverance was unable to go more than four or five miles an hour and was withdrawn from the contest there yet remained the rocket on the rocket george stevenson pinned all his hopes he had battled for years for a great idea he had done work and had faced difficulties which would have crushed many another man but his courage had never failed him now the rocket would show the world whether or not he was ignorant out of his senses and mad and whether or not the steam railroad would become the great highway of the world the rocket made the trial trip at a maximum speed of 29 miles an hour and at an average speed of 15. she met every condition of the contest the spectators were greatly astonished at the wonderful performance the liverpool and manchester railroad was opened to the public in 1830 the event was justly looked upon as of national importance and there was a big celebration a great procession went from liverpool to manchester and back again thousands upon thousands of people gathered along the way to view the great sight but few of those who on that day saw a locomotive for the first time realized the importance of the invention made by the engine right of killingworth in a very few years after that memorable contest at rain hill 
many counties saw the locomotives busy hauling raw materials to the mills and factories, busy carrying the manufactured products where they were needed, and busy in speeding passengers from place to place. The different sections of the same county were thus brought nearer together. Frontier regions were easily settled, new industries were developed, and new markets were opened. The locomotive is therefore to be ranked as one of the world's great inventions, and George Stevenson as one of the world's great men.